Well, good morning, and again, welcome to Crawford Baptist Church. It is, again, my pleasure and, and joy to be here with you to open God's Word, and the hope this morning is that we'll make it through two chapters. So uh, I received a text from Dr. J yesterday afternoon, and, and he asked and said, do you need another week? And I said, if you'll give it to me, yes, sir. And, and so uh, we, I was joking with Pastor Jared last week, I was like, sometimes you just got to cut these sandwiches in half and you can't eat them all at one time, right? And so this seems like one of those uh, gigantic subway footlongs that'll fit on a table and, and we just need to do our best to divvy this up so that we can make it through uh, to honor the Lord, but also to honor your time this morning. And so if you have God's Word in front of you, I encourage you to, to take His Word and turn to Exodus chapter 37. Exodus chapter 37. And as we kind of dive in this morning, there's, there's a lot of implication that we see in the furnishings of the tabernacle and the furnishings and the uh, equipment that is being used uh, to aid into the worship of, of our God. And so these chapters are, are the fulfillment of the instructions for making the tabernacle furnishings. And, and, and it follows this, this natural construction of order. And what you'll see is very interesting. You'll, you'll see Moses begin with the ark, the centerpiece of God's glory, the centerpiece of atonement. And then you kind of move outward, and you see more and more of the lampstand and the showbread table and uh, the altar of incense. And we get outside into the courtyard, and we see the altar, and we see the bronze basin. And we look at all these elements, and they are, they are to be used for the worship of Yahweh, the one true God. But last week, we looked at the tabernacle being built the actual structure, this tent that would, that would house the presence of God. And this week, we're going to look at the items that will fill that tabernacle. We see that every element is to be used in the worship of God, but this week we see that this is God's redemptive plan for His covenant people. How are they to be saved? How are they to come to, to, to know the one true God and not, not fear divine judgment because of their sin? And we see that God has made a way for them to, to be right, to be justified. But it's, but it's ongoing. And what this ultimately points to is our Lord Jesus Christ in his redemptive work, his saving power, because this was temporary. This was something that, that was to just be for the nation of Israel. But when we look at the Gospels and we look and see Christ's perfect life, his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection, we see how all of these elements in the tabernacle point to Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to look at God's redemptive plan for his covenant people. So let's pray together one more time, and then we will, we will jump into the text. Father, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for the time to be together. Lord, I pray that you would give us all clarity of thought. Lord, that you would help us to set our minds' attention and our hearts' affection upon you. And so, Lord, today, we pray that you would be honored and you would be glorified through the reading and study of your text in Exodus 37. 38. We love you, Father, and we pray and ask all these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Just going to jump right in. First, we see God's redemptive plan is seen in the furnishings of the tabernacle. And verses 1 through 5 tells us about the making of the Ark of the Covenant. Moses writes, he says, Beaziel made the Ark of Achaia wood, two cubits, and a half with its length, and a cubit, and a half its breadth, and a cubit, and a half its height. 
and he overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside and made a molding of gold around it and he cast for it four rings of gold its four feet two rings on one side and two rings on the other side and he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark and last week we we learned how the tabernacle was made what the elements would look like we looked at the the people's giving and their stewardship to make this happen today we're going to look at those elements that are going inside and we see four specific pieces of furniture and the ark of the covenant is the first but we also see the table of showbread the lampstand for light and also the altar of incense in chapter 25, while Moses was on the mountain receiving these instructions from God, God revealed to him the pattern of these furnishings. In, verse thir- in chapter 37, we see Moses describing how all of these were to be built. Now, we looked at Beaziel and Olahab last week that God had gifted them with, with the craftsmanship. He had filled them with his spirit to do this work because it had to be done God's way. We can't do things on our own strength and under our own steam. We have to do things according to his word and according to his pattern. Because once we step outside of that, we have now dishonored our Lord. And so there's great intentionality. There was great care taken that this would be that this would be constructed according to the way God had laid it out. Now the ark was just a wooden box right? We, we, we look at it as, okay, it's just a box made of acacia wood. What made it special was the fact that God designed it and that Beaziel took gold and he lined it inside and out. It was, it was made of this precious, it was lined with this precious metal. And it's about the size of a coffee table in someone's living room. That's kind of a, a reference that we can we can have a cubit is about 18 inches and so you can do the measurements but inside the ark God commanded that three things be placed inside first was manna there was a a golden jar we look back early in Exodus I believe it's like chapter 16 where Aaron was commanded to take this man off the ground and place it inside this golden vessel and and that was to acknowledge God's gracious provision of food for the people of Israel the second thing that was to be placed in the ark was Aaron's staff which serves as a reminder of God's power or his supremacy and we see in other portions of scripture especially in numbers where this this staff of Aaron it it budded it grew and the other staffs that were given to the other tribes of Israel did not And so this was to serve as a reminder of God's power and supremacy and authority, one, given to Aaron, but also that it was from God. And then thirdly, we see God's law upon stone tablets placed within the ark, and it was to be a remembrance, a memorial to God's covenant law. And so the covenant ark served as a sign that God is the Lord, that he is our master, he is our provider, and he is our savior. B, we, we see the, the mercy seat teaches us that, that God is the God of mercy, who offered forgiveness on the basis of blood. And this is to fulfill Exodus 25, verses 17 to 22. But if you look in your Bible, it says, And he made a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half was its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And he made two cherubim of gold, and he hammered, uh, and he hammered, um, he made them of hammered work, and on the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub on one end, and one cherub on the other end, and one piece with the mercy seat, he made a cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces to one another, toward the mercy seat were the faces of the cherubim. And you'll say, Stephen, what does all this mean? And so, if, if the ark serves as the cornerstone of God's 
covenantal atonement for his people, the mercy seat is where redemption for Israel would be applied. As we read in the text in verse 6 and follow 6 through 9, we see that there are two cherubim facing each other. And the Bible describes cherubim in other portions of Scripture as the guardians of God's throne room. And so the golden cherubim were a symbol or an indication that the mercy seat was a representation of God's throne. You have to keep that in mind. Because behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, if you entered in there and you were not the high priest, you would be instantly killed. And if you look at Leviticus 10, you see what happens when Nadab and Abihu offer incense that God did not require. These were Aaron's sons. They were priests. They were Levites. And a fire came out from the inside of the Holy of Holies and consumed the brothers. And they died because they did what God had not commanded. They tried to worship him on their basis and their understanding. And they died. And so when we're thinking about the Ark of the Covenant, when we're thinking about the mercy seat, we're thinking about the representation here on earth of God's throne. And the cherubim are those who are guardians of the throne of God. And so when God de descends on the tabernacle, here's what happens. He appears in a cloud of glory over the ark. And we understand this to be his place of, of power and presence. Now we all understand Israel was a, was a, was a loving and kind and generous people who, who kept God's law at every point. And you're like, what? No, they were rebellious. They were sinful. They did the opposite of what God told them to do. They complained in the wilderness. They even, they even cursed Moses and Aaron and cursed God for saying, why did you bring us out here? Did you bring us out here to die? And they were a sinful, rebellious people who did not honor the Lord. And church, the same is true of our culture today. We are all a rebellious people. If we want it done, we typically want it done our way, right? We want it to be done according to the way we want it. Not the way someone else may want to have it. And so, Israel, just like the rest of us, they were sinners. They had transgressed God's moral law. And so, atop the mercy seat was one more thing that would go. And that was blood. The blood from a sacrifice that would atone for their sin. The high priest would go and he would offer this sacrifice once a year called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus 16 and 14 it says, And he, the priest, shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And this would atone for the sins of Israel. And so essentially what would happen on this day once a year is that they would slaughter a goat and it would be a, what, what we call a substitute, a substitutionary offering for sin. Because we understand that the people are the ones who deserve to die for their sin. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, right? Israel deserved to die. We deserve to die for our sin. But God in his mercy has provided us a means to have that sin atoned for. And so this goat would be a substitutionary sin offering. And as I said, the people deserve to die. But instead, the animal died in their place. And so the high priest would then take this sacrificial blood, enter into the Holy of Holies, and sprinkle it on the lid of the ark known as the mercy seat. Because this is where God would show mercy to sinners. Now we've used this word before, 
we, we've used a couple of words that are kind of big. As, uh, Brother, Brother Walter likes to remind me, these are mayonnaise words, so we've got to explain them as we, as we tell them. But the blood served as a means of what we call expiation, meaning that your sins are wiped away. That the, that the table of your sin was cleansed and all of it was wiped away. And we would see verses as our sin is removed as far as the east is from the west. And so it wasn't just expiation, but it was also another word we use called propitiation. Meaning that that blood would appease the wrath of God. The anger that burned against the people of Israel was appeased. Whereas God would no longer judge them in that moment. And this is the economy that we live and work in as we understand the Scripture. You'll say, Stephen, why are these important? These doctrines are critical because it shows us what God did to save you and me. And as we look down this tunnel of time, we see the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very ark and the dwelling place of the presence of God. And he becomes the perfect sacrifice for sin. He becomes the one who wipes away our sin through his sacrificial death. He is the one who once and for all propitiates our sin, appeasing the wrath of God, not just in that moment, but for eternity, so that we can stand before God justified. We can stand before God having his righteousness Because our righteousness is but bankrupt before a holy and just God. We need the righteousness of Christ. And so God knew the demands of his justice had been met when that mercy seat was just soaked in blood. It's it's a brutal picture. Because without the shedding of blood... What does Hebrews teach us? There is no forgiveness of sins. And you try to explain that to people. This is why Paul says that the cross is foolish. What what are we talking about blood for? Why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to shed his blood? To fulfill this. To fulfill what God had promised. And, it, and, and again, it's, it's a beautiful picture of Christ being our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, right? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. It's that great exchange. On the cross, Jesus gets the worst of me. And on the cross, I get the best of Jesus. Galatians 3, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written in Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And then Romans 3, you got to read 21 to 26 to get the context. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a what? A propitiation by his blood. He put him forth as the one who would appease his wrath. Because in his divine forbearance. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that purpose he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so if you believe in Christ, if you believe in him today, you are justified by the blood of Jesus. You were justified. I heard this little thing years ago. It's like, just as if you'd never sinned. That's how God looks at you. And so that when you enter into glory, he doesn't see you. He sees his son. 
because you're robed in his righteousness. And so this is, this is critical. This is really the, really the high point. They should have saved this for the end. But, but the other parts of the tabernacle, the furnishings, are both, I mean, they're all equally symbolic. But since the ark was God's dwelling place, the, the physical throne room placed here on earth for, for worship in Israel, it was obviously the most important piece. But it, real, but it reveals, the other, the other pieces reveal God's nature and His attributes. And so they're just as important. C, or the third sub-point here, the table for showbread teaches that God is a God of providence who sent bread from heaven. Leviticus 24, it, it, it explains the purpose and symbolism of the table of showbread. I'm not going to read that this morning, but you can go back and read those. But, but every week, I'm we'll summarize, the priests, they would, they would bake 12 loaves of bread. And on the Sabbath, they would take, they would place that bread on the table. And it would just sit there. And you would think, well, while it sits there, it's obviously going to go bad. But before the next Sabbath would come, the priest would eat the bread. And, and, I, and I asked the question, I said, so what did, what did this demonstrate? What, what were the wandering Israelites thinking, and what did they learn from this bread? And I believe it showed God's covenant people that, that he was their provider. He provided them with the means and the resources to eat. And as we think about God's providence... I'm going to step, step aside into my sanctified imagination here for a minute. But have you ever sat down at a restaurant and wondered, how did this hamburger get to this table right here? You ever think of that process? How in God's providence that, that meal is sitting before you? That something had to die for you to eat that hamburger? Somebody had to take that wheat and and cut it down, and grind it into a powder, and then make that dough into a bun. And then somebody had to grow those tomatoes on a vine. Somebody had to grow that lettuce in a field. And all of that comes together for you to sink your teeth into and enjoy that hamburger. See, well, that's God's providence. That's God working even the most minute and simple things for your good and for His glory. And that's why we, well, we pray before we eat. We give him thanks for providing what is in front of us. And you may, Stephen, that's, that's kind of far out and outlandish. But if you really take the time and you think about the, the, even to the microscopic, there are no maverick molecules in this universe. Everything from the great to the small exists for his glory. And the food that he provides us and the sustenance that he gives us, it's all from him. And we worship. We can, we can worship while we eat. This tastes so good. I don't deserve this. This is God's common grace to me and to everyone who eats. And so for the people of Israel, it was even more important because they couldn't grow anything. They were in the desert. And as the dew would rise and fall to the ground, we would see the manna would fall with it. Where did it come from? Well, it came from heaven. It came from God. And this table for bread was to illustrate for them the 40 years in the wilderness, God provided them food. People ate, Exodus 16, 35, the people in Israel ate manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. Well, it stopped at one point when they got to Canaan. In Deuteronomy 29, listen to this. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn off your feet. Anybody got a pair of shoes they still have from 40 years ago? Anybody. And, and you've worn them every single day. That's not economical. That's not good for business if you're making a shoe that long. But God in his providence 
provided for his people so that their clothes didn't wear out. Thought about that? That's a miracle. Not saying that term lightly, that's a miracle. God sustained his people for 40 years so that their clothes didn't wear out. And so even the showbread, this table, is to illustrate God's provision for his people. Fourthly here, we see the lampstand. It teaches God is the God of life and light who illumine their path. And as we look at verse 17, it says, He made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work because its stem, its cups, its kylexes, its flowers are one piece with it. And there were six branches going out of its side, three branches of the lampstand out on one side, three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a kylex and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with kylex and flower, and on the other branch, and so for six branches going out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself were four cups made of almond blossoms, and with their kylexes and flowers, and the kylex of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out of it. Their kylexes and their branches were one piece with it. The whole of it was a single piece of hammered work of pure gold, and he made it, and, 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 he, and he made its seven lamps and its tongs and its trays of pure gold, and he made it and all its utensils out of one talent of pure gold. One, just to illustrate the skill that this would have taken Beaziel to do. Two, we see the ornate nature that this was that this was created in. But, but, but the purpose, what is the purpose of the lampstand? And we would say, well, that's obvious, to give light. Well, yes, as the curtains would fall and as they would set up the, the tabernacle inside, it would have been pitch black. If there was any light coming through at all, it was, it was not, you were not able to operate inside. And as, we, and as we think about the tabernacle and we think about the work that the priests were doing, they were never taking a break. There was always work to do because the people were continually sinning. They were continually bringing sacrifices to the front gate and saying, hey, I've sinned. Here's my sacrifice. Offer it on my behalf. And so the work was never done. We're talking 600,000 people. Like you, 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 you couldn't sit down. That's why we see there's no chairs in the tabernacle. There's no need for one because they never stopped working. There was never time for a break until the sun went down. But we see that the lampstand provided light in God's presence. As we read, we see golden buds and blossoms all over it. And it, it would remind the people, it would remind the priest that God is a source of light and life. In Exodus 13, 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. And when I see verses like this, it's like my brain just lights up with other verses in the Bible. Now, I'm thinking about John 1, verse 4, when John writes of Jesus, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. In John 8, 12, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see the connection to Exodus? That if, Israel, if the Israelites are following this pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, they were safe. They were, they were protected. Some say that some commentators have said that the pillar of cloud was to shade them from the sun. It was, it was a mercy of God to keep them shaded from the scorching heat of the desert. And that the pillar of fire was to keep them warm at night. Not just to guide them, but also to provide warmth for, for them. 
And when we see Jesus make this statement in John chapter 8, is this not true for us symbolically? But he who follows, follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And church, I ask you this morning, have we ever come to that moment where our eyes have been opened and the light of God's glory has shone in our heart and revealed our sin to us? Where we, are, we have no place and no other stance but repentance to fall on our face and call out to the Lord for His mercy and His grace. This is what would happen to the nation of Israel as they would see this, this lampstand. Yes, it had a, a practical purpose, but I believe also we see the symbolic purpose as it points to Jesus. It points to Him as being the light of life. And I love this verse too, 1 Peter 2, 9. As Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He calls us into his light. And so we see that the lampstand teaches that our God is the God of life and light and who will illumine our path. Fifthly, we see the altar of incense that teaches that God is the God of intercession who would listen to them when they prayed. As we see in verse 25, it says he made the altar of incense of Achaia wood. Its length was a cubit, about 18 inches. Its breadth was a cubit, about 18 inches. It was square, two cubits High, its horns were one one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top and around its side and its horns, and he made a molding of gold around it. And he made two rings of gold under it, its molding, and two opposite sides of it as holders for the poles with which to carry it. And they made the poles of Achaia wood and overlaid them with gold. And then it says that they made the holy anointing oil and also the pure fragrant incense blended as by the perfumer and so we see this fulfillment of of exodus 30 verses 1 through 10 but this altar was specifically designed and purposed for burning of sacred incense which was which was made according to the special formula that, that that god had given to moses and it was to be offered both in the morning and in the evening and I want to imagine that this incense on the altar, it filled the tabernacle with this pleasing fragrance. That's how my imagination works. As you walk into the presence of God and as you're walking into this place where sacrifice is about to happen, it would set off a reminder that, okay, it's, it's time for business. And doesn't the sense of smell, doesn't that stay with you your entire life? Do you not remember walking into your home and that fragrant aroma of food being prepared in the kitchen? Do you not remember your grandmother's perfume? Do you not remember some of these smells that were pleasant and fragrant? It was to serve as a reminder to the people. But it was also to serve and to symbolize as a reminder of the people's prayers that would ascend to heaven and I and I get that out of Psalm 141 when David says oh Lord I call upon you hasten to me give ear to my voice when I call to you let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice and so the incense was a symbolic thing that was done morning and evening that would symbolize the prayers of his people but it also had a Again, another practical purpose. It was set to be a reminder. And so I believe that the altar of incense was, was Israel's, this, this, this sweet altar of prayer. It was a time where, where people would offer this incense and the priest would burn it. And it was the place where the priest would praise God for his holiness. They would thank God for his mercy as they would present Israel's 
petitions before the Lord in heaven. Now, according to the text, the altar of incense teaches us that that God hears and answers our prayers. Amen? Like, like we, we have to believe that if we are praying. If we are a praying people, we must believe that God hears our prayers. Now, the only way that He hears our prayers is if we are truly in Christ. Because it's ultimately the Holy Spirit who communicates those and translates our, our jumbled mess. And it's Christ who is our great intercessor, who intercedes for us to the Father. And so the fact that we have the ability to pray, and we have the gift of prayer, I think it's one of the most underutilized blessings we have in the church. I'm ashamed to say I don't pray as I ought. I don't pray as much as I ought. And there's always... Prayer should not be a, a, a final option or a last resort. It should be how we begin and end every day. And as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, to pray without what? Pray without ceasing. Go about your day in prayer. Go about your day acknowledging God in prayer. I'll be honest with you, church. Sometimes I get distracted even while I'm praying. My mind will be lying somewhere else. I'm like, what, what's going on? But as I get myself back on track and I'm, I'm, I'm praying and I'm praying for these needs and, and praying for my own soul at times, it keeps my heart and mind focused on Him. And so this altar of incense teaches us that God prizes our prayers, that He considers them important. He considers him a part of the vital relationship that we have with him. And we, like I said last week, we don't got to pray. We get to pray. We get to because God has opened that door of opportunity for you and for me. And so just to, just to summarize, the tabernacle teaches us that God is the God of heaven who dwells with his people on earth. The ark teaches us that God is the God of truth and providence and power. The mercy seat teaches us that God is the God of mercy who offered forgiveness on the basis of blood. The table for showbread teaches that God is the God of providence who sent bread from heaven. The lampstand teaches that, that God is the God of life and light who, will illum who illumine their path and who will illumine our path. The altar of incense teaches us that God is the God of intercession who listened to them and will listen to us when we pray. God is the God of covenant. He makes a promise and he keeps it. He makes a promise to his people. He will fulfill it and follow through to the end. And this was the God who made his home with Israel in the tabernacle. But what is, the ultimate fulfillment? what is the ultimate fulfillment of this? It's not just the building of the tabernacle. It's not just the building of these elements. The ultimate fulfillment and future hope for Israel is Jesus Christ. That is, that is the future hope and fulfillment for the church. That if Christ did not come and live a perfect life, did not fulfill the law in every aspect... And didn't die the death that we deserved and be raised on the third day. All of this was for nothing. And we're still waiting on him to come. But we see that Jesus came to earth to dwell among us. John 1.14 He fulfilled the law for us. He guides us in truth. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. And we read... First Timothy and in Hebrews that he is the mediator between God and man. And his life and death demonstrate God's mercy and grace for us. And so, second main head point here, and there's just two today. We see God's redemptive plan is seen in the fixtures in the courtyard. 
There's three elements here. In verse 38, verse 1 through 7, we see the altar teaches us that blood sacrifice is necessary for atonement of sin. We looked at this when we were talking about the mercy seat, but, but this is the place where the animals were actually sacrificed. And this is fulfilling uh, Exodus 27, 1 through 8. But this morning as we, we look at these first seven verses, it says that he made an altar of burnt offering of Achaia wood. Five cubits was its length, five cubits its breadth. It was a square, and three cubits was its height. He made horns for it on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid them with bronze. He made all the utensils of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, the fire pans. He made all the, its utensils of bronze. He made for the altar a grating, a network of bronze. Make sure I've got my pages right. Yeah, there we go. Under its ledge, extending halfway down, he cast four rings on the four corners of the bronze grating, its holders for the poles. He made the poles of Achaia wood and overlaid them with bronze. And he put the holes through the rings on the sides of the altar to carry it with them. He made it hollow with boards, and he made the basin of bronze and its stands of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And there's a lot of interesting elements here we see with this, this bronze altar. And I remember if anybody had Dr. Dale Yance over at the University of Mobile when we were studying this passage, he said, it's like, when you walk up to the tabernacle, do you know what it smelled like? And we're just sitting there like, what did it smell like? He said, Dreamland Barbecue. I was like, hey, I mean, if, if they're offering animals and it smells like barbecue, then that might draw everybody in. So, um, but, but, it was, but he said that jokingly because, again, you think about the amount of animals that are sacrificed day in and day out, every day of the year, with the exception of the Sabbath. And, and we see what happened is the as, as the priest and the people would enter into the courtyard, they saw these two objects. First was a, a bronze altar. And this, this altar would, would be for the place where they would offer burnt offerings after they would sacrifice these animals. It was nearly eight feet wide and five feet tall. It was like a giant square grill with all the tools needed to tend the fire, to remove ashes, and to cook the animal, and we see later on in Leviticus that, that the priests would be able to take these animals and consume them and eat them. But what's so interesting here is that, that this was something that was always going on. The Israelites offered so many sacrifices that they had to keep this fire burning. In Leviticus, we see that they offered whole burnt offerings both in the morning and at dusk. They presented their sin offerings as a means for atonement of their sin. They presented guilt offerings for unknown sin against God's laws. But, but most importantly, as we mentioned earlier, the priest would offer on the Day of Atonement an offering for his own sins and for the sins of all of God's people. And so we understand that the altar was a place of sacrifice. And sacrifices are necessary. Why? Because of sin. The altar of burnt offering is where God provided substitutionary atonement through the sacrifice of blood. Hebrews 9.22, we mentioned this earlier. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It's true then and it's true today. But the fact is today is we don't have to do it anymore. Because Christ did it once for all, the just for the unjust, so that we might be with God. So there's, the blood is still applied today. And all who believe come under that, that blood that Christ shed on the cross 2,000 years ago. And so in order to have access to God, in order to, to come before the presence of God, something had to die in your place to atone for your sin. Because you cannot enter into the presence of God on your own. There had to be atonement. Blood had to be applied. Now what, 
Here's, here's what's so ironic, right? We see in Hebrews 10, 4, the writer of Hebrews says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away your sin. So, so, so how was one saved in the Old Testament? How was one coming to know God? And we understand that access to righteousness was the same then as it is today. And it's through faith alone. Why did they sacrifice? Because they believed God. They believed God. They did this because that appeased his wrath. It was, it was momentary, but they did it out of obedience. They did it because they believed in his promise. They believed in the future coming of Messiah who would one day eradicate all sin. And so the reason Jesus came and died on the cross was because the blood of bulls and goats were insufficient. But he came and he was the perfect sacrifice. And in Christ, full and final atonement was made so that you and I can have eternal fellowship with our creator forever. This means that our sin debt the sin debt that we had accrued over a, a life of rebellion, a life of disobedience, a life of self-pleasure, a life of you name it. All that debt that we had incurred, Jesus paid through his perfect life and his sacrificial death on the cross. And we come to know him. And we come because the Holy Spirit ultimately draws us, but but in our coming to Christ, we are, we are turning away from our sin, right? Which we call repentance. And we are turning to Christ, which we call faith. And at that moment, we enter into a saving relationship with Jesus as both Lord, as our Master, but also our Savior, who has saved us from the penalty of sin. In verse 8, we see this bronze basin. And the bronze basin teaches us that cleansing is necessary when coming before the Lord. And he made this basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And so the second object that was in the courtyard was this basin of water. The first, the altar was for atonement. The second object was for the cleansing of the priest. This bronze basin, it, it, it symbolized the cleansing power of God's grace that would, that would remove your sins. Because we understand that the work of the priest was, was bloody. It was gory. And they would have blood all over their garments. And, and they didn't wear dark clothes. The priest would wear white clothes to, to illustrate the fact that they had been at work and that things had died behind that curtain. And so they had to cleanse themselves. It was also important because we understand that before they could come into the presence of God, they had to ceremonially wash themselves. You've heard the whole statement, right? Cleanliness is next to godliness. In this case, that's true. Because if you entered filthy and before the presence of God, you would die. That's, that's exactly what would happen. And as we look, it says, uh, Exodus 30, 20, Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so they will not die. Quote, unquote. It was important that when they were doing the work of the ministry, that they were clean. They would clean as they would come in, and they would clean themselves as they, as they left. And so again, we see a practical purpose, but what does it symbolize? We see the, the washing of the Holy Spirit. We see Jesus talking about being born again through the Spirit and through water. That there is, there is a once for all atoning sacrifice made, but guess what? We have to continually cleanse ourselves. This is what you tell your kids. You, you have to take a bath. Why? Because you're dirty. You need to be clean. That is, that is good and right and socially acceptable. But every time the priest would offer something on the altar, they needed to be cleansed. 
And so the bronze basin gives us a glimpse into the gospel. It shows us that once we're saved, guess what? We still do the work of confessing our sin. We still do the work of repentance. We still believe we are, we are cleansing ourselves, not with physical water, but through the water of the Word that washes over our hearts, that sanctifies us, that makes us more and more into the image of Christ. That's the symbolism we see throughout the Scripture. In 1 John 1, 9, we quote this a lot. But if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and what? To cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We all struggle with sin. You know, Caleb asked me in the car last night on the way home. He said, what sins do you struggle with? I'm like, a lot of my sins I struggle with are right here. It's in my mind. It's the battle of the mind. That eventually, if I entertain that sin for too long, it'll make it to my hands and my feet. And so I have to put sin to death in my mind. That's, that's the first place we have to start. And a lot of times, putting sin to death means I've got to be careful of what's being downloaded from my eyes and my ears. Right? Right? We joke around sometimes, all right, listen, the Lord gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're to listen twice as much as you speak. But the reality is, is as we take in information, we have to be discerning. We have to say, is this right and good and just? And I'll tell you, church, we are, we are bombarded with information. You know this. You can put in a podcast, you can listen to music in the radio, you can read articles, you can watch TV, you can look and hear, whatever. That's all downloaded information into our minds. And at that point, if you have not drawn a line to say, this is right, this is wrong, and you're not discerning that, you've already lost the battle. You have to be able to discern what is right and what is true. And as I explained to Caleb, at this point in my life, in the Christian life, the battle is up here. The battle's here. Jesus says, hey, we've got to go to extreme measures. Because if our right hand is calling, causing us to stumble and sin, cut it off. Better to enter into heaven with one hand instead of going into hell with two. Same thing with our eyes. If it causes us to stumble, what does that mean? You know, we, we have to be diligent to put to death the deeds of the flesh. We've got to be able to put to death this, this sin that is in our, in our mind because we're weak. We need to be washed. We need to be cleansed. We need the Word of God to give us a biblical picture of, of who He is and what He demands of us. And it's a fight. It's a struggle. And we struggle with sin. Sometimes to the point of despair. But the gospel is calls us to believe in the power of God's sanctifying grace to cleanse us from sin. That's what the gospel calls us to do. Rest in His grace. Trust in His Word. You're like, Pastor Stephen, that's hard. Yes. Yes, it is hard. Read Romans 7. As you see Paul saying, the very thing that I want to do, I don't do. And the very thing that I don't want to do, I'm doing. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is our rescue. Because we know, in chapter 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're set free from sin. For what? To live for, for Him. To live according to His way and for His righteousness. And so we see this, this basin. And one, and one little, little detail that I, that I think is a notable sacrifice is the mirrors that, that were given up for this. And these is, Israeli slave people, they, they didn't have nice things before when they were in Egypt. And as they're leaving, they, they get all of this nice stuff. And when... Moses calls them to give. What happens? They, they give into abundance. And they give of these things. One commentator had said that 
that they gave of the mirrors, the very things that they would be able to see their reflection on and kind of look at their beauty. And they, they, they gave that up for the worship of God. Gave that up. They gave up of something that was precious to them, that they may have prized, and now it's used for the sanctifying work of the priest and the people of God. And I thought that was a notable thing. In verse 9, verse nine we see... The courtyard teaches us that God's presence must be separate from his covenant people. And for the sake of just time, we'll read a few things. But we see that the tabernacle was surrounded by this large rectangular enclosure. It was was approximately 75 feet by 150 feet. And it was a tall fence made of linen fabric. It stretched across fence posts, and and, and it surrounded this enclosure. And as a resort, as a result, excuse me, a courtyard was formed around the tabernacle, and that's where the basin and the altar sat. And so this fence of linen separated the Israeli camp from the tabernacle where God resided. And it served as a barrier between the Creator and his, His people. And what's interesting is that there was only one way in. And you can see where I'm going with this. The front of the tabernacle had like a, a 30 foot wide opening that covered that was covered by this ornate curtain. And it was designed in, in such a manner to represent the, the entrance into the presence of God. It had cherubim on it. It was ornately designed. It was made of the same material that was that was inside the tabernacle. It was unique. It was purple. It was special. And it created this obvious link between the courtyard and the doorway to the tabernacle where God resided. And when they saw this curtain at the front of the courtyard, they knew. It was the entrance into his presence. But as I said earlier, there was only one way in. There's only one entrance. There's no back doors. There are no side entrances to the tabernacle. And it was forbidden for people to climb over this linen fence. And so if people wanted to meet with God, they had to enter on his terms. And as I think back to the songs we were singing this morning, and we think back to John 14, 6, when Jesus says, I am the way, the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. When Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. When he talks about, I, I am the good shepherd. And you see all of these I am statements in the Gospel of John. You see the connection between the presence of God and the person and work of Jesus Christ. That there's there's no access to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus is the true tabernacle. Jesus is the one who has atoned for our sins. He is the one who continually intercedes for us even as I speak. And so salvation is in Christ alone. And as we read these these texts, and as we begin to look at all that the Lord has given, we see this kind of concluding thought that Moses gives in verse 21. And he said, these are the records of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony as they were recorded at the commandment of Moses, the responsibility of the Levites under direction of Ithamar and the son of Aaron the priest. Beaziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. And with him was Olahab, the son of Ashamash, and the tribe of Dan, the engraver and designer and embroiderer of the blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine, fine linen. And then this little section we see completion. We see that the 
the ark has been created, the lampstand, the showbread table, the, the, the altar of incense, the bronze basin, and the altar. All of that was made so that the people could have access with God. And if you read in verses 24 and following, you see all the materials that they had given for this work. I just want to kind of give you just a little, just kind of a little of accounting here. And I took, I took the two precious materials, what they'd be worth in today's, today's money. So the quantity of this precious, precious metal amounts to more than one ton of gold, three tons of silver, and two tons of bronze. That's not counting the wood, that's not counting the linen, that's not counting everything else. Just the gold alone, that'd be like $45 million worth of gold. Silver, it'd be like $2.1 million in, in, in today's money. And then two tons of bronze, which isn't that very valuable, it's like $9,600. But nonetheless, the people gave all of this. The people who had this exorbitant wealth that they had been given from the Egyptians, they, they give it all. And the Bible provides these numbers and facts to us to demonstrate how lavish the tabernacle was and how the people were giving of their own wealth to God in order to come into his presence. We would agree that, that no effort should be spared when we're called to do something for the Lord. No effort should be, should be out of question because of what he has done for us. All the pegs, all these bases, all the wood, everything that, that they had to design this and to build it and to make this happen, to fulfill what God had commanded them, ultimately God supplied it for them. And so, kind of think back to last week, how they were really just stewards of what actually belonged to God. And I love this thought that, that God always supplies for us what he demands. That when we needed a savior, he gave us his son. When he demanded perfect righteousness, Jesus lived a perfect life on our behalf. When there needed to be a sacrifice for sin... God sent his son to be that propitiation for us so that we could have the righteousness of God in him. And so church today, our, our only hope is Christ. Our only hope is, is knowing him. And all of this detail, all of these elements we see in Exodus, they point us to Jesus. And next week as we come back together, we're going to look at the priestly garments. I was going to try to do that today. Thankful for Dr. J and him giving me another week. But ultimately, the priestly garments point to Christ as our mediator. Because that's what the priests would do. They would mediate between the people and between God. And so next week, as we just look at one chapter, um, which I've already got all that work done, so... Uh, Learned that of yesterday that I was going to get to cut this up a little bit. So just pray for, pray for me, pray for Dr. J and Ms. Pam. I also wanted just to announce before we pray that those who are desiring to go on the Guatemalan mission trip in February during that winter Mardi Gras break, uh, there's going to be a brief meeting following um, our benediction after the service. So if you would, um, meet down here and Ms. Sarah Olson will give you details for that. So if you would, let's pray together and then we will, we will continue in song. Father, we